offerings. We're talking about offerings and giving. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are looking at Numbers chapter 15, and we're talking about offerings. I remember somebody saying to me, I don't give offerings, that's an Old Testament thing. Well, it's in the New Testament too. It's very, very interesting. We'll talk about that in just a few moments, so stay there. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? We're talking about that time when Aaron's staff made a tasty snack. Ryan? <laughs> well, I've got a question for us today, and it's this. Is God slow to anger as passages like Exodus 34, 6 and Numbers 14, 18 teach, or is his wrath quickly kindled as Psalm chapter 2, verse 12 says? It's going to find out. Very interesting. The Bible talks to us. Okay, Janice? It's Friday. It's our wrap-up question of the week. And this week, it's anywhere from Leviticus chapter 22 all the way through Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 15, 1 through 15. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you have come into the land you are to inhabit, which I am giving to you, and you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow, or as a freewill offering, or in your appointed feasts, to make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd or the flock, then he who presents his offering to the Lord shall bring a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of oil. And one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. Or for a ram, you shall prepare as a grain offering two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-third of a hin of oil. And as a drink offering, you shall offer one-third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering, or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow, or as a peace offering to the Lord, then shall be offered with the young bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a hin of oil. And you shall bring as the drink offering half a hin of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each young bull for each ram, or for each lamb or young goat. According to the number that you prepare, so you shall do with everyone according to their number. All who are native-born shall do these things in this manner in presenting an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if a stranger dwells with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations, and would present an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, just as you do, so shall he do. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly, and for the stranger who dwells with you, an ordinance forever throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord." Numbers chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. Numbers 14, Numbers 15, and Numbers 16 is what we study today. We are still in the book of Moses. Uh, these are amazing books. And as we study this, we need to hear what God says to us as we focus on this. Now, I, I was just reading through this and I learned the regulations that we read about today were specifically for the Israelites. Once they had moved into the promised land, began raising animals and farming the land. You see, God told them to worship through making offerings and sacrifices a regular part of their lives in the land. To live in the land was to serve God. To experience the fruit of the land was to experience the gifts of God. And offerings were 
recognition of God as the people's ultimate provider. Israel was a unique country. Its name came from God's renaming of Jacob into Israel. Israel means strived with man and God and prevail. It was a nation that was supposed to be committed to the work of the Lord on earth. One day, God would bless the entire earth through Israel and open his covenant to all people, not just Israel, as we see in the New Testament. Now, as we open our hearts to, and our minds to the truth about God and what he revealed in scripture, we should see the principles that we can still apply in our lives today. We will also learn much about God's Messiah, Jesus Christ, how his provision was prophesied and foreshadowed. Now, this becomes really important. Take your Bible guide out and get a hold of it today because we need to do that. If you don't have a Bible guide, I would encourage you to call us or write to us and you can get a Bible guide. Another way you can do that in seconds is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, uh, click on the Bible guide. It will take you to a place. Thank you for your donations. It will take you to a place where you can download the Bible guide exactly how we printed it. Very exciting. And if you're on Church 365, let me say that you also get this. Uh, this is part of the provision that you get. So take your Bible guide and turn to Numbers chapter 15. This is fascinating. Father, help us today as we read this scripture to understand what you're saying to us. We're not going to plant our ideas in here. We're going to listen to what you said to us so we can hear you. Thank you, Father, for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. Here's what the Bible says. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Do you hear that? That's how he always starts. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land, you are to inhabit, which I am giving you. God's given that land to them. And you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering or in your appointed feast to make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd or the flock. Then he who presents his offering to the Lord shall bring a grain offering one tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one fourth of a hin of oil and one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. Or for a ram, you shall prepare a grain offering of two tenths of an ephah, fine flour mixed with one third of a hin of oil. And as a drink offering, you shall offer one third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Which reminds me of this point. God gave specific instructions on offerings. We still give to God today because we love him and recognize his provision for us. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of God and that we don't have to get so specific with the offerings? But our motivation, why do we give? Why do we give tithes? Why do we give offerings? It's not to accommodate something. It's because we love God. God has done so much for us. We love him. So that's why we give. Well, we read on and we learn this. And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a peace offering to the Lord, then shall be offered with the young bull, a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with a half hint of oil. And you shall bring as the drink offering half a hint of wine, as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each of the young bull and each ram or for each lamb or your goat. According to the number that you prepare, so you shall do with everyone 
according to their number. Point number two, God provided harvest for Israel and they worshiped him with its best portions. Beloved, remember this, as Christ followers, as Christians, we are not to work for money, but to work for God. I want you to keep this in mind. Most people think, well, I'm working because I get my paycheck. Hold on a minute. Paul told us something very different. And this is what God was trying to place into the people of Israel. And if they had prepared themselves and done it correctly, they would understand that we give because we love the Lord. It was God who gave them the grain offerings and God who did all that. So we need to remember that we give because we love the Lord. We don't work to get money. We work because God gave us the ability and that's how we do it. Now, the last couple of verses here, beginning with verse 11, says this. Thus, it shall be done for each young bull. Each young bull, all who are native born, shall do these things in this manner. In presenting an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, and if a stranger dwells with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations and would present an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, just as you do, so shall he do. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger who dwells with you, an ordinance forever throughout your generations as you are, so shall the stranger be before you. Do you understand that God viewed the people, the Israelites, and the foreigners with him as equals. As Christians, we must deal with people with God in mind. He is our overseer. I, I, I just, I need you to understand this. We don't look at foreigners or strangers as not people. We see strangers or non-citizens of our country as Christians. We see them as people that God made. So we have to work with them. Now there's rights and wrong ways to do things. We need to do things the right way. Nevertheless, the people who are here, we need to pay attention and say, Lord, help us to reach those people for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, Numbers 16 and 17, this rebellion against the high priesthood of Aaron. And it's really interesting how God settles this. Uh, it's going to be in your reading tomorrow, starting in chapter 17, where God has Aaron set up his staff with all of these rebel leaders' staffs. And whoever's staff God marks will, you know, be the leader, is the, is the rightful high priest of Israel. And it's really interesting because... God doesn't mark Aaron's staff. What he does is he has it blossom uh, and actually fruit almonds overnight. So it grows a bunch of almonds, which is why I said cheekily that it, it grew a tasty snack because almonds are a tasty snack. But more than being a tasty snack, <laughs> they actually have great symbolic significance in the scripture. Take a look. Almonds became an important symbol for Israel very early on in the nation's development. After the Exodus, Moses received instructions to build the tabernacle, a portable sanctuary where God would meet with the leaders of Israel. The lampstand of the tabernacle was made to artistically represent an almond tree with its detachable lamps shaped as stylized almond blossoms. Then, when faced with dissatisfaction over Aaron's leadership as the high priest, God miraculously caused Aaron's staff to sprout, bud, blossom, and produce ripe almonds overnight. This was a clear symbol of God's choice in priest, 
but also carried a decidedly stern warning with it. The staff was kept in front of the Ark of the Covenant as a sign to the rebellious so that they would not grumble and die as a result. The almond-bearing staff of Aaron became a warning to all who would strive against God. The almond tree appears again in the wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes 12, a chapter that's describing the end of life and encouraging the reader to remember God before the time when the people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Commentators often remark that due to the almond tree's white blossoms, this may be referencing graying hair. But in this context, it may also reveal the almond's association with coming destruction. This association is again revealed in Ezekiel 7, which is describing the end of Israel. Verses 10 and 11 say, See the day, see it comes, doom has burst forth, the rod has budded, arrogance has blossomed, violence has arisen, a rod to punish the wicked, none of the people will be left. The blossoming rod of Aaron has again made an appearance, this time not just as a warning to the wicked, but because in their arrogance they have not heeded the warning of the rod, it now carries with it a sure punishment of sin. Almonds make another significant biblical appearance in Jeremiah chapter 1. During Jeremiah's call to become a prophet, God converses with him. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. There seem to be two things going on here. First, God's using a play on words because the Hebrew word for almond sounds like the Hebrew word for watch. God is watching to see that his word is fulfilled. Jeremiah sees an almond branch. However, given the previously established symbolism of an almond staff as a dire warning from God, this also perfectly sums up what Jeremiah's main prophetic message will be. Judgment was coming to Judah because of their rebellion against God. So there we have it. Some of the symbolism of almonds in the Bible. Now, this is interesting because almonds are a fruit that we eat. Yeah. And uh, today they're very important. But almonds had significant meaning because they also were involved in indicating uh, the ability to grow. And they're in the desert. Yep. And so this is really interesting. Yep. And there's that, the, that ever looming judgment element that comes with them as well. <laughs> <sighs> it's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, God, God creates the ability for the impossible to happen. And this is what he did all through the wilderness experience. Yeah. The impossible happens. And that impossibility, which the people complain about, uh, that can be a problem if we don't understand it. And it's as humans, like you've said before, we get to the place where we just sit down and start complaining, you know, complaining. This year particularly is a good year for people to complain it, but it's a bad year for Christians to complain. In fact, every year is a bad year for Christians or Christ-like people to complain because Christ didn't complain and we should not complain because... He did a lot of praying though. Of and course he pray. did. That's, yeah. the key. that's the difference. We take that to God in prayer. Yes. Of course you do. We take our do. complaining to God in prayer and he helps. Yeah. So you pray <laughs> about the elections. You pray about the people. You pray about the wars. You pray, Lord Jesus, help us. Pray repentance. Pray for God, the souls. Of forgive us for where we've sinned. Help us to get this right because God looks to come into our society and our countries. I think that's very important. So that's very good, Corey. Very interesting. I, I'd like to, I would have loved to have seen that staff. Me too. Yeah. Very definitely. interesting. Me too. <laughs> All right. So we have a Bible. We have question. Ryan. Oh, we have Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, today I'm dealing with a burning question related to God's anger. See, Psalm chapter 2, verse 12 states God's wrath is quickly kindled. But when we compare this to Exodus 34, 6 and Numbers 14, 18, it says God is slow to anger. Now, at first, this might seem a little bit confusing. How can God both be slow to anger and his wrath be quickly kindled? Is God's wrath somehow different than his anger? Well, let's see if we can unravel this. Mm -hmm. 
Although the Bible consistently portrays God as long-suffering and slow to anger, it seems that Psalm 2.12 brings this into serious question, as it says that the wrath of God is quickly kindled. As the English Standard Version puts it, Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. When dealing with apparent difficulties in the Bible, it's always wise to consult other major Bible translations to see how they render the same passage. In this case, when we compare the ESV with other translations, this verse comes across somewhat differently. For example, rather than God's wrath being quickly kindled as in the ESV, the King James Version says that God's wrath is kindled but a little. In the same way, the New International Version, like the ESV, says that God's wrath can flare up in a moment, but Young's Literal Translation says that God's wrath burneth but a little. Though these translations are using very similar words, they are applying them differently, giving two vastly different meanings. Putting it into plain English, the ESV and NIV seem to portray God's patience as small, while the KJV and Young's Literal Translation portray God's wrath as small. The question is, which interpretation is correct? Actually, there is a third way these words could be put together. It may be translated as God's wrath is kindled in a little time. Notice that this translation says nothing of the nature of God's wrath, only that it will happen in a short time. So then, which of the three interpretations is correct? Is God's wrath quickly kindled, kindled but a little, or is it kindled in a little time? From the context of Psalm 2, it is very clear that the ESV and NIV's apparent portrayal of God as quick-tempered is not supported. For example, this psalm is all about Jesus Christ's messianic earthly reign, which is still in the future. This means that God's wrath spoken of in this psalm against the unrepentant has yet to be unleashed. So rather than God's wrath being quickly kindled, he has been and continues to be extremely long-suffering regarding this judgment, allowing time for repentance. Also, this long grace period is consistent with how God dealt with rebellions in the past, such as the global flood and Sodom and Gomorrah. Time and time again, the Lord waited patiently for people to repent, but when they refused, he had no choice but to pass judgment. Also consider the fact that Psalm 2 itself was written as a warning to those who would oppose Christ. This is a great mercy in itself. God, like he has always done in times past, is issuing forewarning long before he takes action. In light of this, it seems best to understand the Hebrew of Psalm 2.12 to mean that God's wrath is kindled but a little, or perhaps kindled in a little time. Since both of these interpretations say nothing of God's patience, there is absolutely no contradiction. God is long-suffering, and no biblical passage says otherwise. Okay, so to resolve this apparent contradiction, we looked at other major translations of the Bible to see how Psalm 2.12 was being translated in those versions which was different. And based on the context of Psalm 2, we were able to determine that the quickness or shortness spoken of isn't referring to a quick temper, but rather to God's wrath being small or his wrath being unleashed in a little bit of time. So God is slow to anger and no biblical passage says otherwise. Now, if you want more on this, then I have made a fuller response to this question on our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And in that article, I also give some helpful tips on how to study virtually any passage in the Bible. All right. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent. Tell us about your weekend show. Oh, yeah. Every weekend, my husband and I release an episode of the weekend show, Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. So basically, we talk about big issues that pop up as we're reading through the scripture. And we also answer viewer questions and comments as well that you guys send me on email. You send me in the comment section. It's it's really fun. It's a good time. So if you'd like to, to join us, then check out my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Corey Babechko. Yeah, very excited. We have a lot of things going on. We have a 24-7 streaming channel, a lot of things happening. So I'm very excited about all of that material as well. Okay. All right. The question. Here it is from Leviticus 22 all the way through Numbers Chapter 16. Minute, minute 58. Oh, we've got lots. lots of time. I could read it forwards and backwards and still <laughs> deliver okay. the answer. All right. So here, this is a bit of a wordy one. The Levites were to stand before the priests and the congregation of the Israelites as an offering for sanctuary service. 
They were to be dedicated for tabernacle service. What was the retirement age of service for a Levite? What was the retirement age? We have 50 years, 60 years, or 65 years. Now, while you're thinking on that. There's discussion going on over here. There are two sections in the Bible in the Old Testament that talk about the year of service that would young men would begin. Mm -hmm. One says 20 years, mm -hmm. and this particular passage says 25 years. Yes. All right? But the retirement age is the same. Is the same. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So don't be confused at home. Five years of what apprenticeship. What will it be? And this is what the thinking is. So 50, 60, or 65 years for retirement mm -hmm. as a Levite servicing in the tabernacle for God, working for the priests. We're what pretty confident. You? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the number that came into my head before you read the answers was on that list. Yeah. <laughs> so that always, that's, that's always a good sign. <laughs> it's very helpful. Um, and so we've conferred and we're going to go with 50. 50. 50. Yeah. 50. All right. Well, let's see if Ryan and Corey are right and you at home. All right. Numbers chapter 8, verse 25 says this. And at the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. And that's in the tabernacle. Good job. 50. I do want to say thank you so much for being faithful to us. Faithfulness is so important. God teaches us through faithfulness. And when we are faithful to giving, as many of you have been, God rewards us and helps us to carry on. This ministry is carrying on because there's enough people who've given to be faithful. If you want to give, may God bless you. Father, I pray today that you would speak to everyone about giving and helping in this economically difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen.